Good morning. Hope you're all doing okay. I know John Price is doing okay. He was um, was he fifty this week, Brian? Was he fifty? Um, he looks about fifty, doesn't he? No, he looks older than that, but he, he yeah. looks old, he's always looked old for his age. I think I think no, actually, he was he was forty. So happy birthday, John. Hope it hope it went well for you. Anyway, I was I was reflecting uh, as I always do on the last six months of of this particular journey that we've been on, this pandemic journey. And um, and I was thinking, well, what, what have I learned about myself? What has this pandemic taught me? What What's it taught me about the strength of, of my faith? You see, God in his providence is always revealing something to us. He is sanctifying us. And he will use our circumstances alongside the word to teach us his way. So we learn from him in the midst of all of this. And ultimately he's shaping us all as we go through this COVID-19 curse, if you like. But he's shaping us all through it. And we need to learn those lessons. See, as Christians, we're, we're to become like the one that we follow. Every day. There are lessons to be learned so that we can become more Christ-like. So how has that gone for you over this last six months? If you were looking back on those six months, would you say that as a result of lockdown, you have become more Christ-like? You know, when it comes to our faith in Christ and our understanding of the way we should live in the light of our faith, we're always learning. Because none of us believe it or not, is perfect. Jesus is our teacher. The good thing about the greatest teacher this world has ever known is that even when we get it wrong, even when we struggle or fail to understand time and time again, he graciously comes along and teaches us the lesson over and over again. He's patient. He's patient with you and he's patient with me. Why? Simply because he loves us. Well, this morning I've gone to a passage in, in Luke's gospel that teaches us three things about Jesus and about ourselves. Three lessons that we can learn today that will strengthen our faith for however long our tomorrows will be. And particularly however long this crisis is going to last. So three lessons. So we've got to... We've got someone reading again, someone who's very familiar to me, actually, it's, it's, it's my wife, in case you didn't know, it's Jill, and Jill's going to read the passage for us now. This morning's reading is taken from Luke chapter 9, verses 37 to 50. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him, and behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulsed him, so he foams at the mouth and shatters him, and he will hardly leave him. And I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marvelling at everything he had done, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he 
who is least amongst you all is the one who is the great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. Thanks, Jill. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that all of our days are indeed in your hands. We thank you that you are sovereign over every circumstances or every circumstance we find ourselves in. And you are sovereign over this pandemic and in the midst of this pandemic, you are teaching us your way. So, Lord, would you, through your word, speak to us and strengthen our faith for all of our tomorrow, should you spare us. Lead us in the way that is everlasting. Teach us the right way to live in accordance with your truth. Father, help us now. Lead us by your spirit to understand the wonders of your, of your magnificent word. So bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So three lessons uh, about Jesus and, and about ourselves that will help us to press on in our faith as we learned last Sunday morning. Firstly then, we're going to learn to marvel at Jesus. Verse 43, let me read it again. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, and then it continues. You see, the crowd was um, the crowd who followed Jesus wherever he went were marveling at what he'd done. And, and what had Jesus done? Jesus had um, just healed a, a demon-possessed boy. He, he had proved that he was the light of this world and who was able to cast out the dark powers of evil. This, of course, was the latest in, in the supernatural mir miracles that many had witnessed and many were marvelling at. The word in Greek for marvel here is thamazo and it carries the sense that this is beyond the realms of explanation. So when they were marvelling, they were thinking, wow, nobody can explain this. All of these miracles... Nobody could explain, and they marveled. The disciples, well, they'd marveled for a long time now, hadn't they? They they had seen so much, and they'd heard so much, especially Peter, James, and John, who had just been on the Mount of Transfiguration and seen his deity and and how how the the very presence of God was 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 with them, with the voice of the Father coming from heaven, as well as Jesus radiating. This glorious presence, there was a voice from, from heaven, the voice of the Father, crying out, this is my son. Listen to him. The only explanation for these marvellous acts was that Jesus was who he said he was, the son of God. Some in the crowd, they understood that and they followed him. But some didn't. So can I ask you, as I ask you every week, do you know him? Do you know him to be the Son of God? How else could you explain these marvellous acts? This was God in the flesh, proving himself by his mighty deeds. So do you marvel this morning? And have you believed this to be true? Have you bowed the knee believing that this is indeed the Son of God? You know, when I first understood and, and believed in my, in my heart that Jesus was God in the flesh, I knew that I now had to listen to him. He was God. He was, he was my creator. I was the, the created. Who was I not to bow down and worship the one who came for me? Do you know, and the real marvel about all this is that he loves me. He came to give himself for me. So turn to the cross 
this morning and marvel. You know, at the cross we see a demonstration of just how much he loves us. He died to save us. He took the punishment that our sins deserve. He took it away. For me, the Saviour on the cross and his resurrection teach me that my sin has been dealt with. And the death is not the end. Because he rose again and because of Jesus, my soul will never die. You know, where is your victory, O death? Where is your sting? Because of the cross and the resurrection, I have nothing to fear. The future will always be secure. So do you feel the same way as me? Do you understand these things? So the first lesson this morning is to marvel at Jesus. And bow down in your hearts and with your lives and worship him. Make sure you listen to the songs that will follow uh, this message. There's a playlist that comes on with the, with the YouTube video. Um, listen to the songs and worship him. Marvel at who he is and what he's done. And, and refresh yourselves in him through song today. So marvel at the Lord as the disciples did and as some of those people who were gathered around Jesus did. The second thing from, from the passage that was read to us is, is learn to be humble. Let me read it, verse 46 to 48. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest, this is the disciples. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. We know from Matthew 18 and Mark 9, which were the parallel accounts, that this argument between the disciples had begun as they walked um, to Caesarea and, and continued, the argument continued in somebody's home. Jesus, knowing this, confronted them. I guess they, they hadn't expected Jesus to know what they'd been arguing about. But as we know, Jesus... The one who we marvel at is the silent listener to every conversation. In fact, when Jesus confronted them, they were, they were like rabbits that were caught in the headlights. They, they froze and they kept silent. It's a bit like as a kid when you get caught red-handed doing something you shouldn't. Can you remember that? And your head goes down and you, and you wait silently for the, for the impending judgment. Mark 9 verse 34 says this in the parallel account. But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. They knew, the disciples, in their hearts that, that what they were discussing was somehow wrong. So nobody spoke. They would have been thinking, oh dear, he knows. You see, Jesus does know. He, he knew their thoughts, he knew their hearts. Man sees the outside, but God sees our hearts. And what he was seeing here was their pride. You know, pride is, a, is an awful thing because pride is all about self. We live in a world that rewards ego that rewards self-promotion. In our culture of celebrity, people's egos are fueled by the adulation of fellow men. Pride says it's all about me. Jesus was never prideful. He humbled himself, became as nothing, even going to the cross, enduring its shame for our sake. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and yet he came not to be saved, but to save. And here were his disciples, 
arguing a bit like Muhammad Ali, if you remember him. I am the greatest. And, you know, they were saying, well, I've healed more. Yeah, but I've seen his deity. I was on the mountain. I was, I was chosen to see that, so I'm the greatest. Pride had a grip on these men. And they had to learn. So what does Jesus do? He gets a child. He uses this child to teach them to be humble, not proud. Verse 47 or 48. Jesus, but Jesus, knowing the, the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever this receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. You see, children in that culture had no voice. They were not important. You know, like the Victorians used to say, and in fact, like my nan used to say, children should be seen and not heard. So when he took a child who was considered to be the, the least in their culture, he was making a big statement. For it's the one who is least among you who is the greatest. A few weeks later, just before Jesus was to be crucified, he would teach them this again in John 13, John 13, 12 to 17. Let me read it to you. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you, truly. Truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he also writes in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. He says there, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves let each of you look not only to his own interests but also to the interests of others we need to guard our hearts against pride pride is is so dangerous in the church it creates divisions and and leads to much hurt and many of you can testify to that Pride makes us competitive as churches, and it should never be that way. And in our social media age, we, we need to guard against um, well, what we need to guard against what we actually put on the internet. Um, we need to guard against the tweets and and, and the, our Facebook profiles and our Instagrams. Um, that says, oh, look at us, we've got it all together. Why go anywhere else except to us? Come to us, we have it all going on. Yes, Facebook and Instagram and all of those are good tools to, to, to forward the cause of Christ. But it should never be about us and our church. That's pride. It should be about Jesus should only ever be known as Christians and in churches for the fruit of the Spirit that's within us. We should only ever be known for love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So let's walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh, one of which, and a big one, is pride. John the Baptist said in, in John 3 verse 30, He, that's Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. So we've learned to marvel at Jesus. 
We've learned that pride has no place in our lives and that we are to be humble. Finally then, number three, let's learn that whoever is not against you is for you. Verse 49 and 50. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. We see in this text some of, of John's pride rising to the surface. Lord, that fella over there who's mouthing off, he's, he's not in our gang, to put it in our language. He hasn't had the teaching, he hasn't followed you like we've followed you. He hasn't got the same authority to cast out the demonic. We have the only way, surely, Lord. And Jesus' reply would have probably shocked him, shocked John and made him think, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. Do you know, John's way of thinking is the way of thinking that has hindered the church over many, many centuries. And is still doing the same in our day. J.C. Ryle was the very first bishop of Liverpool and, and he was right when he said this about this particular text. He said this and I quote, Thousands in every period of church history have spent their lives in copying John's mistake. They have labored to stop every man who will not work for Christ in their way. They have imagined in their pride that no man can be a soldier of Christ unless he wears their uniform and fights in their regiment. They have been ready to say of every Christian who does not see with their eyes, forbid him, forbid him, for he does not follow our ways. J.C. Rowell is right. You see, Jesus doesn't forbid these people or this man who's proclaiming the truth. He says, if they're not against you, they're for you. You see, God is working out his purposes in every tribe and nation and, and in every Bible-believing denomination with all of its own culture and its own traditions. He's working out his purposes in churches whose styles and doctrinal bases of faith may be different to ours. And we spend too much time worrying about these things and being critical and wanting to spend hour after hour debating these things, particularly over the internet. You see, Jesus is not saying to John, go and join them, is he? He doesn't say that. He just says, don't stop him. If he's not against you, he's for you. Do you remember the Apostle Paul when he wrote to the church at Philippi? They were concerned about um, those who, who preached Christ from wrong motives. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul replied to them. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. See, Paul rejoiced that Jesus was being proclaimed, regardless of the motives of, of those who proclaimed it. So whenever the name of Christ is lifted up, let's all know that God, in his wonderful plan, is working out his purposes. 
So let's learn to rejoice that the great name of Jesus being raised up, maybe not in the way that we would do it, but let's learn to rejoice and, and to be less critical or not critical at all of other churches. And let's get on with the work in our own particular vineyard. And let's not be looking our own, over our shoulder at what others are doing. We have a particular vineyard. And the Lord has a, has a particular work for us to do in the environment that he has put us in. So let's stop concerning ourselves with what's going on over there. So three lessons we've learned from the Master this morning. Three lessons to take us into the weeks ahead. So let's learn to marvel every day at his wonderful works and ways. Do you know if you do that? If you keep looking to him and you keep praising him, there'll be little room for pride. There'll be little room for being critical of other, other churches. And secondly, let's learn the lesson of humility. Work at being humble. Augustine was a, a fourth century Christian theologian. And he once said when writing to a friend about the Christian life, these words about the best lesson that this particular Christian could learn. And, and I quote this. This is, this is in Old English, so you'll have to try and follow. He says this. Well, actually, it would have been in Old Greek, but I'm not going to read it here in Old Greek. Anyway, he says this. To my dear Dioscorus, I think I pronounced that right, but there's a great name. I wish you to submit with complete devotion... And to construct no other way for yourself of grasping and holding the truth than the way constructed by him who as God saw how faltering were our steps. This way is first humility. Second humility. Third humility. And however often you should ask me. I would say the same, not because there are not other precepts to be explained, but if humility does not proceed and accompany and follow every good work we do, and if it is not set before us to look upon and beside us to lean upon and behind us to fence us in, pride will wrest from our hand any good deed we do while we are in the very act of taking pleasure in it he was right humility 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 so let's endeavor to kill our pride and walk humbly before the lord in the days to come and thirdly let's rejoice that the great name of Jesus is being lifted up regardless of who is lifting it up. Let's pray for all the Bible-believing churches in Liverpool, particularly in our region. And let's rejoice that the gospel is being proclaimed. So marvel, be humble, and rejoice in gospel pro proclamation wherever it's proclaimed. Three lessons to take into the week. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you are the greatest teacher. You speak to us into our lives, into our lives that often don't reflect who we are in you. We thank you that you keep coming back to us. We thank you that you keep reminding us of these, of these truths. We truly do marvel at you this morning. We marvel at who you are. We marvel at what you say. So Father, help us. Rid us of any pride. Lord, if we have done anything prideful this week, we ask for your forgiveness. And we pray as we move into today and into the days ahead that we would be humble. Lord, if we have to go to anyone to apologise, then in humility... Let us do that. And Father, let us rejoice. 
rejoice that somewhere, even now, not just here, but in other churches, the great name of Jesus is being proclaimed. Help us, Lord, not to be critical, but to give you the, the glory that you deserve as your name is proclaimed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And we bless your holy name. And it's in that name that we go. Amen. Thanks for being with us this morning. And um, we meet again tonight at, at 6.30. So please, please join with us for that. And let me remind you again, as I remind you last Sunday, mo Sunday morning. Yeah, it is remind you last Sunday morning that, that we have our Zoom prayer meeting on a Wednesday. So please join with us in, in, in that wonderful time of prayer. As together we worship, as together we marvel at who the Lord is. So it would be great if you logged on this week, if you haven't done so already. Please do. Anyway, the Lord bless you. Have a great day.